Jaws was, of course, a seminal breakout movie. We we're held responsible for all the monster movies that come out in the summer ever since Jaws did. But Jaws barely had started its record-breaking run when the studio demanded a sequel to be called Jaws 2, naturally. After the sensational return of Jaws to the screen, what could possibly be more terrifying than Jaws 2? Steven Spielberg would have none of it. He had done the definitive shark movie. Sequels really weren't in vogue at that time. Planet of the Apes, you know, was really the forerunner of, of all of the, the sequel trend. At first we had hesitation, do, do we want to do it? Because it was like trying to recapture winning the lottery. It was the thing to do. It was almost expected. People wanted to revisit that island and see what they would find. We decided that if we didn't make it, somebody else would make it, and we felt very protective about it. So we went on to design it. What is it about this place? Everybody's a boat freak. It's an island. I'm going sailing. Again? I think we have a hell of a good season going for us. You don't think that if a shark was destroyed, that another shark could come in? Sharks don't take things personally, Mr. Brody. I think we may have another shark problem. No fin, no sharks. Nothing but a boating accident. I want that boat out of the water by tomorrow night, and I mean it. What's that man doing way up there? He's looking for sharks. Out of the water! Out of the water now! Oh, God, he swim! That thing, I know, is gonna kill him! I know what a shark looks like because I've seen one up close. I don't intend to go through that hell again. wonderful time in the next the uh, development of the script for Jaws 2 was almost as chaotic as the product early production of the movie Peter Benchley the first writer of Jaws had different ideas Arthur C. Clarke did call us and he had an idea of some great undersea object that was in the Indian Ocean. It was a grandiose idea. We couldn't quite grasp it. Howard Sackler, who had written, with the help of Robert Shaw, the monologue that Shaw gave concerning the demise of the USS Indianapolis in the shark-filled waters during World War II. Howard wanted to actually make a movie of that. It was turned down because it was too far from the mothership and wouldn't resemble Jaws enough. We realized that what audiences would really want to see was Chief Brody and his family, and we should go back to the island. So that's what we did. We wanted to go to Martha's Vineyard for a limited time, two, three weeks at the most, and then go down to Florida and do all the water stuff. We had a director named John Hancock, who briefly was on the project. John, very talented, but utterly ill-equipped for this particular movie, as it turned out, left the movie. So the uh, studio just sort of put a hold, and uh, we all came back. At the time, Verna Fields, who had won the Academy Award for editing Jaws, she had a new position with the studio, a vice president. She said, uh, well, it looks like Ned Tennant, who's president, wants to pull the plug. They discussed different directors, Otto Preminger, Frankenheimer, you know. And there was even talk about Vern and I co-directing it, but the DGA wouldn't allow that. 
when I did night galleries, I did the night galleries for three seasons, there were all these young directors, you know, Spielberg and John Badham, and you know, Schwark was one of the directors that I was very close to and I thought very creative. We had worked together intensely on Rod Serling's Night Gallery, which was a terrific show. And he was the production designer, he was very talented, and we got along very well. And then I started doing well, let's say, in long form. I'd done a couple of pilots. I'd done a low-budget picture, a horror film, which got some prices in Europe. And when Jaws 2 happened, I, it, it was totally unexpected. I was preparing a pilot for Quinn Martin. And suddenly I got a call from Joe Alves. And he said, would you like to read something? And I said, sure, fine. And he gives me the script of Jaws 2. And I said, but wait a minute, Jaws 2 is shooting already. He said, yes, we're shooting, but there was a problem. So I read the script. And suddenly, out of the blue, I get a call from Verna Fields. And then we had a meeting with uh, Zanuck and Brown. And then they asked me about the script. And I told them what I thought, which was that the action sequences I felt were very good, but I thought some of the character development was weak and some of the dialogue was not very strong. And then suddenly they started asking me, well, what would you do? And then I started saying, you know, well, I think what would make sense is to pick a real good action sequence that could be orchestrated and would take a while to shoot. And while we're doing that, then we can rewrite the script. And then I think within 48 hours, I had the film. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. Carl Gottlieb started the rewrite. Then we all agreed that I was focusing on the action sequences and, and the orchestration. Then he was really concentrated on the characters. So Jano and I talked through the outline. We did a presentation at the studio got a green light and off I flew to Fort Walton Beach, Florida to start work while the company regrouped. I'd be working in my office in this hotel that was by itself on a beach with no other people except the company, 120 people waiting to go to work. And every time I left my room, 120 different people, perfectly well-meaning, would say to me, how's it going? <laughs> and I'd go, it's going fine. And walk a few hundred yards and they go, how's it going? Oh, just great. And I couldn't go out of the room without hearing, how's it going from somebody in the company. And then eventually I turned out enough pages to get us shooting. We expanded the character of Roy Scheider. I thought there was this nice obsession, you know, with the shark coming back and this, this kind of personal demons that no one believed in. We have a lot of deaths in these waters that never turn up. Are they all shark victims? Then we sort of strengthen the couple because of their son being in jeopardy. All I know is a boy is dead and my son and husband are still out there. And also we fleshed out the kids to try to give each one of them a characteristic that people will recognize. Because we had to spend so much time with them. Do you always do what your parents tell you to? No. Good, then I'll be at the dock at eight. I had this notion that this cruising culture that was very popular with, with cars at that time, I said, what if kids cruised on the water the way they cruise on the boulevard? And they've got these elaborate boats that they fix up and that they use, they socialize and all the boy-girl stuff. Tim, did you see the way she was looking at you? I mean, she wants you, man. The interplay between the, the kids can be in connection with this cruising culture. And everybody said, what a good deal. That's a good idea. And I want that boat out of the water by tomorrow night. Dad, please, can by I just take it By tomorrow night. And I mean it. In terms of the cast, I had Roy. And you know, Roy is a sensational actor. But at the beginning of the film, he was not very happy. I don't know if some of it was due to the fact that he didn't want to do the film or whatever. But once we got into the film, then he was great. And he really delivered. Listen, do me a favor. Act as if you've been here the whole time. How do I do that? Just look bored. Lorraine, I knew and I'd worked with before. So I had a relationship with her. Brody, hey, how are you? How are you? Hello, Martin. I think it went well. Oh, oh hell of a speech, Larry. Right. And Murray Hamilton, I had no problems at all because since I'm a film buff, you know, we talked about all the movies I'd seen him in. One day I heard from one of my spies that Murray Hamilton was leaving the set. He was leaving for New York. We had established Murray Hamilton as the mayor, as he was in the uh, original. 
Thank you, Amity High School Band, for that eloquent selection. I managed to intercept Murray in the lobby of the Holiday Inn with his baggage in his hand. I said, sit down, Murray, what's going on? He said, David, I couldn't care less about my career. My wife is going through a biopsy for cancer, and I want to be with her, and nothing will keep me from her. I have to be there to hell with my career. I said, Murray, I understand completely. What if we finished all your work in the next two days? We recalled all the actors from the sea. We rescheduled the scenes in the town hall. Martin, this is kind of an official meeting. We finished all his work in the two days and sent him to New York. His wife was given a pass on her biopsy, so she was okay but Murray died. But I did have the pleasure of seeing him again in the looping stage here in New York. And his wife was ever so grateful. And I couldn't imagine any other way of handling it. Zanuck and I agreed that Murray deserved that. Fine actor, he finished the job. Oh, Hendrix, good, right this way. Excuse us, please. I want you to come in here and uh, check out this 908. What the hell's a 908? I never heard of a 908. 908 means get me out of there. Jeff Kramer, who plays uh, Roy Scheider's uh, deputy, when I showed up, he was not on the film. And I said, what happened? I liked that character in the first one. They told me, I think the first director didn't like him or whatever. So I said to Carlo, let's bring him back. Want me to run out there? So we brought him back, and then Jeff and I became like brothers. Happy to do it. The camera crew was fantastic. I had seen some of Michael Butler's work, and then we established a relationship immediately. And then his brother, David Butler, did a lot of the second unit photography. And suddenly, we realized that the ocean, Mother Nature, is nothing to make fun of. Out of the water! Out of the water now! It was incredible, the punishment. Any kind of equipment would take the minute you went into the water. And we were in the Gulf of Mexico, which means there were days where we had huge waves, and we had one tile amount which was a mount with a gyroscope that you put the camera on and even if the ship is moving the camera will stay horizontal no matter what and then we had this round contraption that we put in front of the camera the thing that turns very very fast so will prevent spray from going into the lens so all the shots that involve the big shark when they were combined with bad weather became really a nightmare you take a sequence like where the sailboats start turning over each sailboat was anchored underwater, and the shark was on this three-ton platform. So then we'd bring the shark and put that in the middle, and then you'd pray that the wind wouldn't change, because if the wind changed, you had to start from scratch. I kept saying from the beginning, we must show the shark a lot. Because that image of the shark coming out of the water for the first time, it's already happened. In the first one, that is never going to happen again. And it was interesting to me because everything I kept hearing a lot was, don't show the shark. Joe Alves, who was the production designer on the first one as well, had brought Bob Maddy out of retirement to do the shark for the first one. And Joe had a lot to do with it too. Here, it was more ambitious. We used the same molds, so we didn't have to remodel the shark. But all the interior structure, all the valves and the electronics and stuff had to be redone because the sharks from Jaws uh, 1 were put out on the back lot, unfortunately, and, and just left to rot. It made Bob Maddy develop a very, very complicated system. And we had basically the same process of a platform shark that was the expensive shark. We used to call it the luxurious shark. And the reason that the area of Florida had been chosen was because it was the proper depth. So first you sunk the platform, 
Then you put the shark on top of that platform and it was on a sort of little train, guided like a, a missile. One other alternative we had was we had a fin, a big fin that was pulled by a boat. We did a faster a sea slid fin, which we used for the water ski sequences and uh, some of the fast boat sequences. They had also a life-size shark that was pulled. That entailed a whole new series of problems, which was that whenever you wanted to shoot the shark approach and you had to wait till the boat that was pulling it went out and you had to hope there weren't gonna be any ripples and the angle was perfect. And then we asked them to try and fix that shark so at least it would open the mouth and do something so it looked as if it were gonna bite. So that we would have an alternative whenever there would be problems with a luxury shark. We all agreed that what had been done could not be duplicated because the opening of Jaws is extraordinary. I think it's the strongest opening of any film ever made. But then I said, let's make it then very beautiful, you know, very sort of ethereal and strange, like another world. So then I think Carl came up with a very good point that to try and make it a plot point. And then the value of that opening became, instead of just being a titillation to tell the audience there's a shark, uh, we didn't need to do that. They already knew by the fact that they'd committed to see the film that was a shark. So then it became also to establish uh, a, a sort of a clue which would work later, which is the photograph. We had to be careful that there was good visibility. When the currents get too strong, you can't see anything, so you can't photograph. So that opening we shot uh, at the end in Catalina, which is in Southern California. When you go to a place like Catalina, what you're getting is the depth and the scope, which is the existing nature underwater. So it's very good when you're doing people swimming towards you or swimming away from you. But when you get to very precise things, like seeing the shark and the head of the shark, it was just so complicated an operation that we would have never pulled it off. So we decided we would do that at an underwater tank uh, at MGM. <laughs> We get Eddie on location. I think he was cast here in L.A. Here's your blanket. <laughs> they take him out there and he can't swim. He can't swim at all. Eddie, swim! Swim fast! It's a shark, Eddie! Swim! He may have added to the sequence that he was afraid of the water because he was supposed to be afraid of the shark. Oh, God, Eddie, swim! <laughs> I felt very early on that we shouldn't see the shark. Eddie, hurry, faster, come on! We just didn't know exactly how to do it. And at one point, the idea came, why don't we just have him being pushed? So they rigged some kind of harness, and they drug him with a rope. idea that Eddie would get a death grip on the boat and be holding on so hard that when the shark pulled him away, he pulled a piece of the boat with it. That splintering of the wood told us, you know, how desperate his grip was, how strong the shark was, and it's a great horror film moment to see, you know, a human being breaking wood just because they can't let go. From the beginning, I had this thing about being on the shark behind the film. And so we had a special frame made for the camera, and the frame went on the shark. Well, it didn't work. And finally, I had this idea. I said, let's get a cowboy saddle. We got a cowboy saddle, we put it on the shark, and then the operator did it handheld. He jumped on the saddle. It was hilarious to watch. <laughs> Oh, 
But you spent the whole day on that shot. And we weren't getting in the sun. The light was getting down. The timing was never right. Because again, you had to let the boat that was pulling the shark go by. Either the boy was pulled too soon and the shark was late. Either the shark was early and it blunted its nose against the boy. Either it hit the sailboat and suddenly it started doing whatever it wanted. You know, it was not an exact science. Finally, at the end of the day, it was one of the last shots. Things went wrong a little bit, but in the right direction. What happened is the pilot boat made a wider curve and suddenly the shark was much more parallel and we had this incredible approach. And you can see the mouth open, it's unbelievable. Just as they pull, and he was white as a sheep because he suddenly was inside the mouth of that huge beast. I mean, I got goosebumps watching it. When I first read the script, it said, shark eats helicopter. I go, boy, this is stretching it. You know, how are we gonna pull this off? We saw this little bell helicopter with pontoons. And it looked very small and very fragile next to our shark. And I said, well, this, this is credible. And the fact that sharks are attracted to sound and that the pontoons could look like seals, it created some credibility that this could be a sequence that wouldn't be laughed at, but be, could be pretty frightening. We did all the approaches with the real helicopter shooting inside the POVs. And then the art department built this life-size replica of a helicopter, but that was much, much lighter, so the shark could destroy it. Now hold on to something. Okay. The first day, they started the blades, and it sort of started shaking, and it flipped over and uh, wrecked the whole shot. The next day we come out and the shark comes and it miscues and it gets locked onto the camera boat and so we had to wrap. The fourth day we finally got the shot where the shark grabs the uh, pontoons and turns it over. When I was uh, an actor in the movie of MASH, we actually had a helicopter that you know lost power on a takeoff and when it would. So I've actually seen a helicopter crash close up. So I knew some of the things that you don't see in movie helicopter crashes, which are usually just spectacular fiery explosions. The uh, disintegration of the tail rotor and the main rotors is a spectacular moment. I mean, things go whizzing through the air at you know, almost supersonic speeds. I can remember listening to an enthusiastic crowd of kids outside of a theater. Uh, having just seen the movie, and, and one of them say, Jaws, eat a helicopter this time. I came up with the idea where really the shark obliterates this person, and then that person is gone. That was a very, very difficult shot because what happened is this was with the luxurious shark and we had to put the shark in position so that when it came out, it would be the right angle. Then what was happening is that that shark had to come out and she had to be pulled back down by some underwater divers at the same time. I think it took us a whole day to do that one shot because we got it, but it never worked exactly. I mean, she was early, the shark was late. At that point, I didn't know whether it would work or not, or what impact. I just had this idea. And then when we saw it, it was just incredible how strong it was and how economical, because it's one shot. I'm sorry, Larry, I can't stop thinking about this. Well, you better try, hey, right? Come on, don't oh, do it. God, please help us. Jesus. There's a famous painting called the, uh, the Raft of the Medusa, which shows survivors on a raft struggling against the forces of the sea. And I think the intent was to get some of that into the, into the movie. And you know, 
who you know knows art history as, as well as anyone, I think, was familiar with that painting. The contribution to Jaws II was largely the result of Janor Schwark's direction. He gave it a bit of sophistication, visual sophistication. I thought there was remarkable scenes with the kids in the water. I think that was some of Janot's best work. Most all of his action sequences, I think, uh, stood up with the first picture very strongly. And I think he did an admirable job in inventing ways to keep the tension alive, even though you had seen it in the first picture and seen it now here again, uh, I, I thought he did that quite brilliantly. Cable junctions ahead. Can we make it? I don't know. We needed an island, and even if we could find an island, we couldn't shoot an island with the shark mechanism because the shark sat on a platform and it moved like, like that. So islands come off like this, so we couldn't get close to the island. But if it's on a barge, the shark could get real close to the island because it has no bottom. The island was like two huge barges. And I gotta tell you, this was like a major, major build. It was incredible, you know, I don't know, thousands and thousands of square feet of uh, fiberglass rock and we had this old aged uh, structure on it and we anchored it in this place. And of course, suddenly the, the Coast Guards got a lot of calls about people who used to go fishing there all their lives and suddenly see this island that they never seen before. And then the weather got really, really bad. And one night, I remember, I was awakened by the Coast Guards and the island had broken all its chains. <laughs> the Coast Guard said, Geno, your island is on its way to Cuba right now. So they had to send other boats to go and bring the island back. I think it was the next morning after the island was on its way to Cuba, I suddenly got this call, and Joe and I rushed to where the platform shark was. The ocean was so bad that the platform was like this. It was on its side, and there were divers holding it with lines to prevent it from toppling over. And if it would have toppled over, it would have been the end of the, of, of the luxurious shark. And, but eventually he got it back down. Pull yourselves over. I'm gonna get the hell out of here. As in the case with Jaws, we still weren't able to master the shark swimming away. So we used some of Ron and Valerie Taylor's footage similar to what we had used in, uh, in Jaws. That footage always worked for us. Whenever we need a little bit of something, you know, a little bit of movement, speed that we couldn't produce with our mechanical shark, we, we had that great footage that they had done. We were all in Navarre Beach. We'd been there from August 1st. We were there till December 22nd. I never thought I'd see a Christmas tree in the Holiday Inn where the crew was staying, or our young actors having to put ice cubes in their mouth to prevent their breath from showing because we were shooting a summer scene in December. It was crucial to finish that location before the holidays, not only so we wouldn't be lynched, but also in order to finish the picture because we still had all of post-production underwater and things waiting. So finally someone came to the studio, the idea that we would work without a break. The crew asked me, I said, will you give us your word that no matter what, you will not shoot past December 22nd? So I gave my word. And then I told Zanek, I said, look, we're going to be working straight, so there's got to be a party every Saturday night, so we know it's Saturday night. And we worked 22 days without a break. <laughs> We broke down the end of the shark in chunks. So we did the approach, getting the shark in position. Now, the whole blowing up had to be done separately. It was a special head that you put around the cable, you know, it was tied, and then you blew up. And that was the last shot. It was the last shot 
of the last day before we were taking the charter plane the next day to leave the location. And we had to shoot it when the light was low, something to do with the exposure of the explosion. So we're trying, I had, I think, six cameras, and everybody, the whole crew is around. Michael Butler is looking at the horizon, says, you got two minutes left. And I said, OK, we go. And they put the wires. And we had a battery malfunction. And I really thought everybody was going to kill me. And then suddenly, the assistant and I swim together, get the boat battery. So the special effects guy, he went, switched the battery very quickly. This was like a movie, you know? The light is going down, the light is going down, and finally, shh. That night, we had a huge party. And the next day, we took the charter and went home. From the beginning, I think we all agreed that the film could not be too long, that we wanted it lean. I remember we lost some scenes that were good, actually, that had to do with more of the development of character between Lorraine, Gary, and Roy Scheider. You're jealous. You are. <laughs> there was more about the enmity between Roy Scheider and his wife's boss, Joe Mascolo. Now he's going to get it. There was a scene where he gives him a ticket. I was only parking here for a second. Brody, I went inside to get my briefcase, and I was going to take right off. Can I see your license and registration? You're kidding. Nope. Honey, don't you have any pull with the chief here? Oh, would you please take it out of the plastic folder? No, I won't mention his personal attack on me. I've never seen him like this. Hendricks is a qualified deputy. I say that we use him. There was a scene when they fired Roy Scheider. There's a vote, and Murray Hamilton ends up voting for Roy. He's the only one. All those in favor? Anyone opposed? And we ended up losing that scene. I suspect that we felt it was slowing the whole thing down. There was also some elements of the helicopter sequence. The pilot was being attacked underwater. It was essential that Jaws 2, as with Jaws, get at least a PG rating that would permit children to see it. Otherwise, we'd lose most of our audience. We had a body count that exceeded any movie we had ever made. We were acutely aware of the rating problem, and we did reduce it to some degree. Dick Zanuck and I were so infatuated with Jaws 2 that we had an idea for Jaws 3. Our idea for Jaws 3 was Jaws 3, people nothing and it was going to be a send-up of Jaws 2 and Jaws. We were gonna do a spoof because we thought that was the only way to pull it off, uh, to do it as a spoof, but not to do it as, as a scare movie anymore. And the attitude at Universal was, you're fouling your nest, you can't do this. We should have fouled the nest, it would have been golden, maybe even platinum. I think that Jaws 2 did about a third or maybe 40% of the original, which was gargantuan, which suggested to the motion picture industry that if monster movies could give birth to sequels that did 40% of the original, that was a good business because there wasn't as much risk. I think we may have another shark problem. But the sequel business is very tricky. It's become almost a cliche, but Jaws 2 was obligatory. Show them a picture of that shark. They didn't see it. See only what they want to see. It was an enormous challenge for us as producers, but we had to make a good film. We just didn't want to throw out a cheap copy. We had to provide them with some depth wherever we could with these characters and a, a different kind of story. Because I don't intend to go through that hell again. In many ways, it was tougher to do the second one than the first because we were competing with the first and it was a tough act to follow. 
The first one, you couldn't beat the three guys. That was a relationship, you know. This was more about a community and its fight with the, with the shark. One of the reasons Jaws 2 is a successful sequel is that uh, Jean Swark, the director, did some fantastic visuals to go along with the story. You know, putting cameras on fish and special effects and all that to get those spectacular POVs, that was Jeannot's work. I'm very proud of it when I look at it. The odds were extraordinary, the difficulties were immense. I don't know how we did it. I think we did it day by day, but when I look at it, it stands on its own and it works.